and welcome to Dream Nation. I'm your host, Yulia. And before we go on with the show today, I would love for you to share this episode with a friend because sharing is caring. Also, if you can share it on social media, I would super appreciate it. Uh, share it on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Snapchat, um, on Instagram. I'm everywhere. So say hi and share it with a friend. So today on the show, I have Jamal Hodge, who is a filmmaker, writer, director, and producer. And we're going to talk about pain, identity, hope, and power. He creates films tackling social taboos. So, of course, we're going to talk about Harvey Weinstein because that's been happening for a few months now. And that leads us to talk about power, right? Like who we give power to in our lives and how people can have power over us and how we can claim our own power. That part of the conversation was super interesting. Um, Jamal's films... He uses darkness to show light in order to show the breadth of humanity, and his work has been featured in Khan, in Sundance, Tribeca, Big Apple Film Festival, other film festivals like NYC Horror, Blackstar, Baltimore, Urban World, Hollywood Black Film Festival, and many more. I love doing this podcast. We ended up having background music uh, because we ended up filming at the W due to reservation stuff with a space. So in a weird way, if you kind of like listen to the music it gives a much lighter note to the whole entire interview which is really interesting because we talk about very very heavy subjects like pain and power and identity and hope and uh, I think the music actually adds a really nice little ray of hope to all of his messages which are really great lots of really great quotes came out of uh, this podcast and I'm gonna have Jamal back on the show um, probably in a few months after his projects wrap up So um, enjoy the podcast. I certainly did. And uh, tell everyone about the show. Have a great day. Enjoy. Thank you for joining me on the show. And uh, today we're recording at actually the W, which is really random because I booked a spot at the Broad. But I think I booked it through a robot. So the robot did not tell me that there was nobody at the door. So Broad, you might want to tell your robot to uh, look out for weekend hours because people might need to use the space on the weekend and be able to get in. So I'm here with Jamal and he's a director and I'm really excited to speak with him. And my first question is, what was your dream as a kid? Originally, actually, I wanted to be uh, sort of like a writer and a pastor, which is kind of bizarre because um, I've always wanted to be like a helper my whole life. Maybe because I was, my mother had seven kids and I was like the third oldest. But the second oldest, you know, the, the girls are both um, are the oldest and the youngest. And then in the middle, there's like five uh, boys. And uh, my older brother, you know, he was president in the beginning, but then he started getting into a lot of things because of some of the difficulties we ran into as, as children. So after, after that dream kind of melted away because of life circumstances, so my second dream became I just wanted to survive when I was about eight years old or nine, or my family became homeless in the South Bronx. And this was like kind of like around the crack era, like the end tail of the crack era. And my only goal was to survive the situations that we were in, because we was in some pretty, uh, see some really crazy things. Just been in some really bad spots. Martinique Hotel was like one of the worst shelters in New York at that time in the the late 80s. And to be there as a kid was really uh, dangerous. but eventually my dream evolved into me doing what I'm doing now, which is uh, being a storyteller. And I started seeing religion and everything else as stories, and I didn't really understand it in depth when I was younger, like in that way. But I just started seeing that, now I could see it clearly, like stories give context to reality, to life. You know what I mean? And storytellers are willing to look at the one thing that everybody, that we fear the most as human beings, which is reality, you know? So I think that's the best way to help people is to be able to show them glimpses of reality and um, glimpses of what makes us all human, the, the light and the dark. So as a director, what do you look for in stories that you want to share with the world? The things that I love in stories is that I love, um, I look for pain. And I I know that sounds really weird, but I have this like crazy belief that pain is the pathway to happiness. And what I mean by that is that, you know, pain is a part of growth. Growth is progress and progress is happiness. You only can be happy when you're making progress. So 
it's honestly to be happy in life, I really find that a small tribe against a big obstacle that they have to share some uniform form of pain to achieve this goal. That's when people seem to be happiest. So like in a lot of my stories, I'm always trying to explore the relationship that characters have with pain. I think that's actually one of the most defining factors of life uh, because how we view pain dictates how we interact with other people and life and whether we have a victim mindset or an achievement mindset. And so like if you see pain as an enemy, a friend, or as a teacher, it changes the dynamics of your perspective in life. And I try to show those different perspectives in the films that I'm attracted to. So like my films usually are dark, but I use darkness to show light. I forget who said it. It might have been uh, Jimmy Bean. I'm like obsessed with Jimmy Bean. But Jimmy Bean said something like, pain is knowledge entering your body. If something hurts, you just gain knowledge. Yeah. Like you stubbed your foot, you're not gonna do that again. That's like, pain is knowledge entering your body. And I think as artists, we, we need pain in order to be creative. If you don't have pain and you don't have anything that you have to overcome in your life, you might not create anything, or you might not strive to overcome anything or create anything. Like, and pain's not a, like just a physical thing, you know? It's more like a struggle, you know? Like, to live is to struggle, and if you don't struggle, you don't really live. This is why, you know, the opposite side of, of pain leading to happiness is how comfort leads to death. Because comfort, a lot of times, leads to stagnation, and then you start decaying and then you die. So, 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 you know, as artists, I think we have the courage to face pain. And of course, pain is different from suffering. Suffering is unnatural. Being in a prolonged state of pain or something beyond your limits or something being inflicted on you in that way is it's not natural. And, you know, I'm not condoning that. But we do, as creatives, as artists, struggle as our best friend. I really believe that. And courage. Courage, right? Courage to do anything. Courage to wake up and just walk out the door every morning. The courage to face reality. I mean, everybody else in every other job is trying to run away from reality. And as an artist, you take reality on. So you take that, you take that burden on yourself so that you can share it with people. But that takes courage because it takes courage to step into something knowing it's gonna hurt and to stay there in order to relay a message or to give context to people, to our audience, you know what I mean? To millions of people. It's kind of like, especially with actors, people say actors are like selfish, but they selfish in their personal lives a lot of the times so or seem self-centered because they constantly share their souls with the entire world. They give the most intimate parts of themselves over to somebody else or somebody else's vision. And that's a level of generosity that most people never get to experience in their life. And it's also interesting that you mentioned reality and courage because movies are an escape from reality, right? So people go to movies to experience different realities and also to escape. Like, I think that's why there are a lot of like superhero movies happening right now. People just yeah. want to escape. I think it's true. I mean, certain types of movies are escapes. The rug is being lifted and we're seeing all the mess. So that's, we're dealing with reality in real life, so we don't want real life in movies right now. We want an escape. We want to hear that it's all gonna be okay because somebody's gonna save us. But predominantly, I think even in the superhero movies though, there's always themes in there of real life or giving context to real life situations. It's just covered up and packaged in a way where on a conscious mind, you don't really notice. But even superhero movies are dealing with themes of reality that people don't want to face in general, you know? How do you think stories shape our society? I think, I don't want to get too meta. I get a lot of my business partner, they complain to me. They're like, you're always living in meta, man. You got to stop that. Just be normal sometimes. I'm trying to work on it. No, don't be normal. No, you're special. To avoid the normals who are going to tell you you're normal and who will want you to be normal. Be your meta self, because that's what the world needs. Okay. I'm going to just go all in now. Go all in. Go like <laughs> I'm going to go the architect deep from... Go for it. From go <laughs> Matrix deep. Matrix. Like, I will join you. Matrix part two, architect deep.
Yeah, I'm there. You know what, life is all about digging in the deep and deconstruction. And a lot of people don't want to go deep because it takes work and it makes them think. And it is our goal to push people to think. And they don't want to hurt. That's basically why it is. Most of the things with everything with people is that they don't want to hurt. And it goes back to the pain. They don't want to feel pain. Because they see pain as an enemy and it's unnatural. Yeah. Yet it's a gift in its own sense. Okay, so back to the question. You know, how does story shape our society? And uh, as storytellers, what is our role in shaping society through stories? Well, I mean, if you always look at human tribes, I mean, human beings are like weird because we have like the longest gestation period in the world of any other mammal. Like we kind of stay with our parents. For, like a human being literally cannot survive unless they are loved by somebody else. It's really a bizarre thing. It's like babies, if they don't get touched or things like that, they just die. You know what I mean? And and, and, and uh, any mammal, we stay with our parents the longest. So we like the longest of development. And I say this, it's because I feel like through that entire process, we're always telling ourselves stories. Because our, our, our brains were like meaning making machines, but the meaning has no uniform context. But since we're so dependent on each other, we need a uniform context. And the storytellers, the filmmakers, the writers, the singers, the dancers. The preachers, the church. The producers, every, the churches, the religion. They, they create a uniform context for all the meaning that we have. So basically the storyteller has always been like the shaman. All those people have always been the person that has fed our souls and kept us together as a tribe, given us our identity as a tribe, and also given that tribe a world identity of the world. So, you know, storytellers are the people who look at the sun and call it the sun. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? They, they look at it or they say it's a god or they say it's fire or they say, and, 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 the, and the funny thing about um, is that if you look at science and I say this a lot scientists are really storytellers too because the story comes first the theory and then they back it up they research it to back it up but the story started first a lot of times the theory comes first the story comes first so like our whole reality and most of the things that we have, most of the things that we shape is the stories. We even think of ourselves as, as a story. story. Right? Yeah, we all have our own story. Our identity is a story in a sense. Well, it's up to storytellers and ourselves to also know that we can re reprogram ourselves with a different story because we, I think all of us stick to our own story, yes. right? Which is like whatever story you grew up with telling yourself. Yes. And I think the world changes when you start telling yourself a different story. And that is one of the hardest things to do in life because how can you forget everything that's happened to you, right? Yeah, it's, it's all the words that you tell yourself and what people tell you. And uh, I guess maybe it's about having a major vision in the end and like knowing that you can control your story at any point. And I think a major part of that, of knowing that you control your own story stuff is a more fati. It's like a saying that I love, you know what I mean? The love of fate, mm -hmm. which means um, when I look at my past, I've had a pretty rough past of what most people would consider really rough. I didn't really get to have a childhood, and I think that's why I'm trying to relive that now, but through art. But like, I feel like Amor Fati, your love of fate, is kind of like loving everything that's ever happened to you in your past, and seeing it as your fate. And then understanding in the future, your fate is to die, but to love that too, and in the, and in the present moment, be completely aware that you always have a choice. So it's, it's like the freedom of choice in the moment to, to tell yourself whatever story you need to tell, to, you know, to, to, to give to the world, to give them a story that can inspire others in the moment, but to accept the story of your past and accept your end at the same time, the story of your ending. Well, it's just gratitude for existence, right? Like. I look back on my life and I'm like, holy crap, it's me. Like, I grew up in a village without running water to like a single mom and a grandma. And now and I'm sitting on a W with you having a podcast. It's all because I opened up that heart space. I think I was very lucky, right? We all have like people that help yeah. us. Yeah. But it's also Obviously. about opening up that heart space to actually welcome that. Because the universe wants you to succeed, right? Somebody told me that, I'm sorry, like uh, Clifton King, you know, he told me one time that I couldn't accept a compliment. 
or somebody would give me a compliment, I would counter with a reason why I didn't deserve it or, you know, for years. This is, for years I was doing this. So he was like, you know, you gotta learn to just say thank you. Because if you can't accept gratitude from people, then that means you can't have gratitude in your own heart. You know what I mean? And he's like, and he was told me that I was really like the key to not only success, but to wellness. And um, I started implementing that about five, six years ago and it really changed my life right. on every level. So I do agree with you 100% about like the power of gratitude. You were just in Khan. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Oh yeah, so in the last two years, we've had like short films in Khan. It's so insane to me being like a guy who used to, was raised eating sandwiches, like soy sauce bread sandwiches and mayonnaise on bread. And you know, sometimes going two days without eating that I'll be on the red carpet at Cannes. It's craziness. We had two films in Cannes and um, that experience really opened up my eyes about that I not only deserve to be there, but a lot of the people who were like me were there. It's like finding an extension of, your, of a tribe, going to a place feeling like you're gonna be a stranger and then finding your tribe in that place. So, you know, I realized there are people like me. I'm not alone more in this world as an artist. There's a lot of people like that are committed to excellence, that have big ideas and big dreams that come from nothing, that are making things happen. You know, it's not really a unique thing, at least not in can. you know what I mean? So that was great. I also love the spectacle of it. I have to admit, you know what I mean? Like the shallow part of me loves all the glitz and the glam and the circus dresses that the women were wearing and how beautiful everybody got to look every moment of the day. And of course, you know, the South of France is like one of the most beautiful places in the world. And um, it's just great, man. But the best part of, of everything with me is not really the experiences that I'm having in the place, but it's actually being able to share that with my team and my tribe. You know, being able to go there with my producers, you know, Patrick Thompson, Chase Mirror Tour, you know what I mean? All these people who invested in me and believed in me and be able to share those experiences with them, that's the best part to me, you know? It's, that's the best part to me. That's why I even said like, you know, even making money and making wealth, being able to make money with people is the best part of making money. It is, right? It's being able to make money with your friends and be able to like bring your vision to life. Yeah. The best thing ever is working with friends. Mm -hmm. Everybody in filmmaking does it because they want to be with this tribe. It's kind of like running with gazelles, right? You just start galloping and everybody's in sync. I feel like, I feel like it's like old school hunter-gatherer stuff. Like when dudes used to go out with long claws and spears and we'd be like, we gotta hunt this thing or nobody's gonna eat and then we kill it and then we skin it and then we bring it back and then everybody eats for pants and then we all eat. You know what I mean? That's how I kind of look at it. Like, it's still kind of like the Wild West where there's some sense of, of a hunt. Yeah. You know what I mean? A lot of other places, it's like everything is provided for you, but for people who are courageous and they want to go out there and create something and hunt and bring something back, and you know, I, that's how I say it in my head because, you know, I'm a violent guy, I guess. Well, <laughs> no, it's, it's, I mean, that's the male nature, right? Women are gatherers, men are hunters. That's another thing I want to talk yeah. about because, you know, with women, it gets really funky when we try to be hunters. Yeah. It disrupts the whole entire nature of things and that opens up a whole entire discussion on feminism. You know, there's something to it and I think it's really interesting. I think everything about that is just, everything is based on harmony. It's not based on balance. People confuse balance and harmony. Balance is like mathematical. So balance is more like the, like the economy of outcomes, like, like, like trying to create measured outcomes, which is not natural. Nothing in nature is like that. It's unnatural, it goes against natural law. Harmony is more like every piece fitting, no matter its size, into a single song. It's more like music. So I think, I think it's better to be more like music than to be like math. I'm really bad at math, so I'm gonna go with a second. <laughs> That's the reason I That's went into math. art. You know, you were just in Cannes, you have, um, you have Jump, which is on Amazon, The Jump. Uh, do you feel like you are being heard as a director? Okay, so you know, scale changes everything and ambition with scale, so yes, I am definitely being heard as a director in comparison to two years ago. Um, we put a lot of time, a lot of effort to make that happen. You know what I mean? We've, in the last two years, been in like, close to 40 film festivals and we've won like seven awards and 
you know, it, we've, we've been getting our work out there. People are starting to know, like, we had, like, over a thousand people show up for our uh, casting um, the other day, last few days. So people are starting to know, I guess, what I'm doing and stuff like that, which is a weird thing for me, you know what I mean? Um, but... I'm nowhere near where I want to be as a director in terms of like where my ambitions are. I know at a certain point everybody had to be where I'm at. Everybody who I look up to as the great directors. But you know, I like to compare myself to the best and not compete with them. You have your own voice and you're always competing with just yourself, right? That's the number one thing with acting. Yeah, especially with art because it's like, it's always weird to me when you get awards for films because how's your film better than somebody else. I, I don't know. It's like, is it based off of craft? Or is it based off of your film made people feel more? Or is it based off of the message or the meaning? Is it based off the times and how your film connects to the times? It's like, how do you say one piece of art is better than another piece of art? Every person's piece of art speaks to somebody's heart in a different way. It's like a different frequency, you know what I mean? So is it just the frequency that everybody's on in that moment, or is it like, you know, it's, it's really weird. So I always think that's kind of like a little silly. It is silly, and which brings me to the next question, which is how can Hollywood work with more directors to get more voices out there? Really? Hollywood's like 80% white dudes. So that's another thing, right? And mm -hmm. how do we get more authentic stories that people want to hear, that people resonate with? How do we break through? Well, the whole Harvey Weinstein thing happening oh right now. God, They're holding that stake on who gets to tell stories. It's a culture of that of that space, of that Hollywood space. And I think that on the male and female side, there's people that are creating that culture. You know what I mean? I don't think it's just like, because no nobody's gonna do something for that long in, in that way, or even have the confidence to do that in that way, unless it's been successful for them multiple times. That's just the truth. So it's kind of like this exchanges going on from both ends that are like suspect that I don't agree with. And, it, and like I was saying, like a lot of times coaches create monsters, but we always like to feel like our hands are clean. You know what I mean? Like nobody wants to take responsibility, but like usually it's a collective demon that's being created, you know? Well, I was hanging out with my mom last week when we were talking about this. My mom is hilarious. And she's like, I was reading interviews and an actress is like, oh yeah, Harvey Weinstein raped me twice. She's like, wouldn't you get out of there the second time around? She's like, wouldn't you know that that happened and I'm not gonna put myself in the same situation? Be in an intimate setting with somebody like that in the first place. Why are you even in a position where he even has a bathrobe on in his house? Like, why are you even at his house? You know what I'm saying? It's like questions people don't ask. People are like, oh, he wanted me to massage you. Uh, my head's back on, on the bed and I felt this but why are you doing in this house anyway? But here's the thing, but it's all about power, right? You know they can control your career. So you're like, okay, this is weird. Maybe you have hopes for the best. This is the way I look at power. Power is where people believe it lies. Nobody really has more. I mean, people have more power than somebody else because other people give them power. It's kind of like, well, how come a king could tell a knight to go and die for him, but the knight is the guy with the sword? It's because the knight believes that the power rests with the king. But in reality, he's the guy with the sword. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Well, so it, it's perspective. It, the power is all about perspective. And, and a lot of times people, they don't have enough faith in their own careers. They make other people responsible for the outcome of their careers. They don't feel like they have a destiny. They don't believe that 100% wholeheartedly in themselves. I believe I have a destiny. I believe that I need people, but no one person is gonna decide whether I'm successful or not in my life, in anything. You do need people, but you never need that person. That's how I look at it. And when you make yourself need that person, then you submit yourself to the will of that person and you, you technically give up your power. So a lot of times in life, people's greed creates the vulnerability for them to be abused. Ooh, that's a quote right there. You know, and we don't like to think about that, but it's the truth. Your, your, your desire for an outcome is makes you compromise yourself. And it makes you put your faith and your power into the hands of flawed, corrupt individuals. So how do we get a bunch of people who are not corrupt 
And how do we send out the Batman sign and get everybody to work together and create studios and help each other fund films? I think if you are honest and you have the love of craft, we gotta get more people who have the love of craft and not the love of money or the love of fame in it. it the, one of the major things that creates the demons in Hollywood is other people's love of fame and love of money. If you enter into it with the love of art, with the love of the craft, with the integrity of an artist, you know, people always telling you in these film schools now that I think it's ruining the craft, oh, you gotta be more of a business person, you gotta be more of this and that. And I feel like people are entering the business now with, with distant, genuine desires. And they're doing things for the wrong reasons. So when you do things for the wrong reasons, there's always somebody out there that's like, I'll give you those things for the wrong reasons. You know what I mean? And you empower those type of people. But when you're doing things for the right reasons, you, you empower the people who are there with integrity, who are like, I'm here to do something to make a difference and stuff like that, you know? Because kind empowers kind. So like these Harvey Weinsteins, these Brett Ratners, we created those monsters with our own greed, with our own lust, with our own desire for fame. Without our desire for fame, without our desire for money, they'll, be, they'll have no power. That's beautifully said. So you're working on a horror film next. Mm -hmm. Called The Kind Ones. It's based off a short film that, went, that, that got me the can last year mm -hmm. that I did. Um, and it's won like awards. Um, it won like a favorite short film at New York City Horror Film Festival oh, that's in great. 2016. Yeah. yeah, it's one of the oldest on the East Coast. I love the people there, they're all cool. You know, shout out to the team out there. Um, and you know, it's been, it's been shown around um, and now I'm wanting to expand it into a feature film because it's a film that deals with a lot of pressing issues like about like the different types of societal monsters and how we create monsters out of people and how with the, if you stand for somebody else and they stand for you, you don't have to become a monster based off a of circumstance or abuse or pain of hardship. You know what I mean? The, the, the thing that keeps us from, I guess you would say submitting or, or collapsing into despair, into evil, into anger, into hate, is the reflection of ourselves in another person. Yes, it's true, right? I like the line that says, we usually hate something in the other person that is a direct reflection of ourselves. So it's not that we really hate a person, it's just like I have, a weird obsession with Kim Kardashian and I'm like why is she famous I don't understand she's so vapid like I I try to watch the show this weekend but I was like but I'm realizing it's not a healthy obsession because I was like I hate the Kardashians because they don't contribute anything to society and I was like wait I got to take this inside and be like what is this I'm like oh I'm frustrated because they have like a million zillion followers for doing nothing I would argue that they've done a lot for society just not necessarily what you value or I value but, you know what I mean, there's a lot of people, society is not based off our individual values. So there's a lot of people that value the stuff that they're promoting as they would not be successful, as they would not have this stuff, they would have not have these followers if a bunch of people didn't share those values and they weren't serving those values in some way. That's the hardship, that's the thing that messes with our brains, and that's what I'm saying, facing reality. Facing the things, the world, not the way that we want it to be, but how it is. I was kind of like a student of the master keys and stuff like that. You know, one of the major things, the major secret to reality or perspective that gives you power over reality and an abundant mindset is understanding that everything in life that you can see and you can touch is an idea made manifest. So everything is starting out in somebody's head. So the entire material world is an effect is not the source of anything. The source of almost every physical thing that we have in all our systems is internal. So the real world is inside you and the external world is actually the effect of the real world which is inside all of us. But the beauty is that the same thing that can give somebody the imagination and the will and the belief to manifest a car or to invent a desk or a table or a film or a story it's in all of us. It's in every human in the world. So everybody has that power, but we don't know and we give it up to these people or to fear. Yeah, we do. We do. And then and then and then 
we weaken ourselves and then we call ourselves victims. But really we didn't want the responsibility of our own gift, which is the gift to shape realities by our will, by imagination. We all have that power, you know? Well, speaking of uh, gifts in your film, I kind of I kind of sidetracked from that one. So you're fundraising for your film right now. Yes, yeah, so um, we're fundraising for several things. We have a faith-based series, because I do really dark movies and really light movies. <laughs> it's a duality, you know, I like to explore both. So I like to inspire people, and I like to terrify people <laughs> and take all their hope from them so they can understand the value of hope. Because I feel like when you just have something in abundance, you don't value it. So I like to take it away in the film and make you feel that loss and then give you a hint of it at the end, you know, or sometimes not. Just take it away and let you walk back into your life <laughs> wanting to kill yourself. No, you save people. So, well, well back to horror movies, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know who, which horror house I love? I love Bloomhouse. Bloomhouse is amazing. God, I, I want to work with them so bad. bad. So I was on their Wikipedia page. Their first film was $15,000, mm -hmm. and then they made like millions on it. They produced Get Out, and actually one of the guys from Bloom House just connected with me on LinkedIn. Hey! Awesome. Hey. Well, I'm in contact with me. So uh, <laughs> I was going to actually ask you if you've pitched Bloom House, because it seems like they would be a really great partner. I have not yet, but I think it will be a great fit. I make those type of movies, high quality, low budget, with a social spiritual or cultural theme, you know what I mean? So like, you know, I think it's a good market for that. I think people also want to hear the stories from the perspectives on things from like black directors or minority directors, women directors. I think there's like a big push for that. And I think that we're providing something fresh now to the market. And I think that uh, it's exciting. It's an exciting time for, to be a black director that's doing dramatic horror movies or a female director that's doing action movies or dramas or you know you have like this diversity that's starting to emerge in an industry that was predominantly 80 to 85 percent white male i mean even now walking in as a black director it's really weird like most of the black people i see on crew are like grips or pas you, you, you know what i mean so i'm always dealing with uh egos, you know, a sense of mistrust, people feeling like they there, that I need their help to be competent. <laughs> <It's so crazy. laughs> Which is hilarious to me. I think that's something that women and All minorities time. share. Yeah. I think black men and women deal with that a lot. It's like you can never be the authority. And if you are, it's by the grace and mercy of these people who know better, but they're gonna be charitable to help you be competent and rise to the occasion. I can't even tell you that, Hilarious. you know, working in advertising, I always have good ideas. My ideas always sell. If you're gonna put me in a room with a bunch of creatives, my ideas are gonna make it. I just know it. I know how to write and I have really good ideas, but as a junior art director, I would have the senior men in the agency presenting my ideas to clients all the time. Mm. And that would drive me crazy because yeah. I was like, wait, here's an idea that I thought of that I designed, but here's the schmuck, yeah. but he's presenting. That's a bigger issue for advertising. You know, I'm digressing. No, no, no. I understand exactly what you're talking about. And I think in the film industry, it's even more like that. I mean, it's weird because the film industry is supposed to be a liberal heaven or haven, supposedly, but it actually has the most segregation, racism, and just sexism that from almost any other industry. Well, you, it gets really crazy when you have two minorities on the same film, right? It's like, yeah. well, which minority do we promote? Or like, <laughs> oh, we have two women. How are we going to sell this? It comes from the executives being so old. They're like out of touch with yeah. what's going on. Everybody's kind of bored with the same motif, especially like with the white savior motif, with the whole thing. People, audiences are bored with that. People don't want to spend their money to come and see that too much anymore. They want to see different story, different perspectives. I really believe that. And I believe like there are some benefits to being like rare, you know what I mean? Because when people doubt you, the things you do right have twice the impact, you know? And I always be like, yo, why are you so surprised that I'm going to Cannes? Why are you so surprised that I'm winning this? Why are you so surprised? Your level of surprise shows your lack of what you actually thought 
before, you know what I mean? Because why are you so surprised? What do I always say? Your perception of me is not the reality. Back to your movie that you're fundraising. The Kind Ones and A Happy Divorce, which where? is a faith-based um, movie that we're done. Where can people reach out to you at? And where can they check out the oh. films? If they want to support me and what I'm doing, if they want to support art that uses darkness to show light, something that inspires people, and entertains them at the same time, they can check out my work on directorhodge.com. My information is there, my work is there for them to take a look at. Early top of next year, DirecTV is gonna be showing the short version of The Kind Ones. I haven't announced that yet, but now I guess I'm doing it. You heard it here first. Dream Nation, baby. <laughs> All exclusives. <laughs> <laughs> but like, um... We the best, Dream Nation! I'm obsessed with Khaled. Congrats, that's huge! And then uh, we're gonna start fundraising like early, I would say spring, on the feature film. I'm also gonna be directing a TV show that I can't name yet. That's great. My final question is, what is your dream as an adult? My professional dream is, um, I wanna be, I wanna do something that people have really done, which is being a successful author. Um, I write a lot of science fiction and I also write some, uh, I guess you would say horror, sci-fi horror, stuff like that, novels. And um, I want to be a successful film director. Starting the next two years, I'm going to release a feature film every two and a half years and a novel every other two years. And, and do that for the next 20 years. That's kind of like my plan, but the dream that I have in terms of like my contribution to society and the world is that I want to kind of change people's relationship with pain and relationship with fear and each other. I don't want to tell people what to do. I just want to teach them compassion. I want to expand their perspectives. I want people to understand that the combination of knowledge and perspective creates wisdom. And wisdom is what sets us free when it's combined, you know, with love. I call my podcast Dream Nation Love because I think love is like the only basic thing that people forget and it's free. And they forget to love themselves, love people all around them. And um, love is like another element of this universe. Like you've got water, fire, like the fifth element, right? Yeah. Love. Love leads to compassion. Which one of the best movies of all time, in my opinion? I love that movie. It is. It's the best, right? I love it. Well, I love your work. That was great. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks for tuning into the show. I hope you enjoyed it. Please share on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Dream Nation Love. It's not Dream Nation Podcast. It's Dream Nation Love because I think my single mission in life is to teach people how to love a little bit more. And together we can save the world. So it's Dream Nation Love, share it with your friends, have a great day, and go out and make the world a better place.